This is Peter Helland with Dr. E. Michael Jones on the show Israel. And we're going to try to cover some territory that we've done in the past, but we're going to do it here by looking at uh, a new review you've done here on this movie called Hunters. And we're calling the show uh, Nazi Hunters and Their Proxy Warriors. And your review here is going to touch on some issues like we did a show in 2015 uh, when the, the church came out with uh, a statement called the gifts and calling of God are without, um, I say repentance, are irrevocable. And uh, it's very interesting how you come into this subject. Uh, you start out this, uh, your, your article here, over the course of 2019, the Jews lost control of the narrative in America. Okay, and then halfway through the article, you repeat that phrase and you say, in 2020, there are even fewer, if any, Nazis still alive, leading us to the question, why this film now? The answer is loss of control. The Jews lost control of the narrative in 2019 and Hunters, the name of the movie, is their way of getting it back by asking deep moral questions like, is it moral to kill Nazis? Well, the first question I have to ask is, what do you mean they lost control of the narrative in 2019? Well, uh, what, this is the culmination of uh, the arrival of a new technology. Uh, what, what you had before this time was pretty much total control of a narrative by a certain group of people. Uh, you had publishing, you had television, you had movies, and they were all controlled uh, according to certain rules where you weren't allowed to say certain things. Uh, during the course of the last, uh, whatever it was, what do you want to say, five, ten years, the Internet increased in importance. You had platforms like uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube, uh, later Twitter, where you could suddenly uh, have direct access to the mind of, what would you say, a billion people, in potential, potentially, and there were no rules. There were no rules governing this. And so uh, people started saying things that they would not have said uh, on mainstream TV, uh, mainstream publishing houses, or whatever. And as a result, uh, the Jews got upset because uh, a lot of it was criticism of Jews, uh, criticism of Israel, for example. Uh, and that uh, was easier to deal with because the Jews ha had in the White House uh, Jewish money, specifically Sheldon Adelson, Paul Singer, and Bernard Marcus had helped elect Donald Trump, who was the most pro-Jewish president in American history. And when it turned out that there, were, there was a movement called BDS, uh, boycott, uh, whatever the other divestment, two, divestment uh, sanctions, uh, that had been gaining steam. The Israelis did not like it. Uh, they were calling for a boycott of uh, Israeli goods in the interest of the Palestinians. And so instead of dealing with the issue by saying, okay, you have a point, we haven't treated them fairly, we're going to do X. No, they didn't do that. They never do that. They, they went right to the source and they said, we need to find someone powerful who will ban this. And Donald Trump did. He signed an, a, 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 an executive order making criticism of Israel basically illegal. And then Benjamin Netanyahu went back to Israel and he said, hey, I just overturned the First Amendment in America. Vote for me. I'm the, I'm the, big, I'm the biggest guy, uh, the, most big, the biggest mocker in Israel. Vote for me. That was one example. But it was bigger than that. It wasn't just the BDS. It was bigger than that. People were starting to talk about things in a way that uh, Jews did not like. So they reacted by talking about hate speech. Now, hate speech is a creation of a Jewish organization called the Anti-Defamation League. They made it up. Uh, there's no content to hate speech, okay? It is simply any speech that Jews don't like, especially Jews at the ADL, who presume to speak for all Jews. And so they, in, in November of 2019, kind of the, this thing's, the whole campaign against hate speech is reaching type of, some type of culmination. Um, they have their meeting, and Sasha Baron Cohen shows up, and he basically threatens Silicon Valley. Now, why he had to threaten them is anybody's guess, because they were uh, basically had uh, some big 
uh, Jewish donor gave money to Silicon Valley and the ADL so they could police the internet for hate speech. So you would think they were insiders, but it turns out they're not. And this meant that uh, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen gave a speech in which he threatened the, the people, threatened the, the lady who's the head of uh, Facebook, not, I mean uh, YouTube, and said, if you don't do what we say, you're going to go to jail. And then the next day, the ADL issued a statement uh, saying, these people have to be banned. There were 10 people on the list, and I happened to be one of them. Okay, and uh, nothing happened. Okay, and uh, so I'm still on all of those platforms, which is a sign of what <laughs> point I'm trying to make, is they're losing control. Okay, there, there are people now who are saying things that they don't like. And they can't seem to get it under control, not even by threatening to call you an anti-Semite, which is the ultimate death sentence in American culture. If they call you that, you're dead. You, you will lose your job. Every bad thing will happen to you. And it's not, it's not working. So it's not that the, this is the only, so they got BDS, they got the ADL, but that's not the only weapons they have in their arsenal. They control the production of movies. And Hollywood has controlled this for a long time. I mean, Hollywood is a Jewish creation. Neil Gobbler said that. It's okay if he says it. If I say it, I'm an anti-Semite. Well, the most important thing you've ever, you said about the power of movies was the, um, the uh, concept of the black man, uh, that he was this revolutionary. And then they came out with some movies and, and, uh, and it shifted who the black man thought he was. Yeah. So yeah was that I, powerful? Yeah, that was, uh, uh, that was in the uh, 70s when suddenly there was a, a Jewish operation uh, called the Black Panthers, funded by David Horowitz. Uh, the fund, that was the image of the black man as the revolutionary. Big afro, guns, you know, Huey Newton in his rattan chair. And they didn't like that anymore, so they changed it to the pimp. And so you had Superfly and uh, Shaft as the new paradigm. So they can change the paradigm. The paradigm here uh, the, the, the movies, they've said this before, it's not so much an immediate issue, it is to shape the general perception in the culture. And the shaping the general perception means giving you some sense of what is permissible and what is not permissible. What is good and what is bad. So now let's get back to this um, problem. The problem is hate speech, right? The problem is peep incitement to violence. That's bad, right? Well, sh normally. That's what, I, I'm not stupid. I got that message from what the ADL is saying. So now we have a movie called Hunters, put out uh, by HBO. And wait a minute, they're doing exactly that. I can't believe my eyes when I'm watching this movie. So it's basically, uh, it begins, it's 1977, you got a character Meyer Offerman, who was played by Al Pacino. Now, this is important, too, because Al Pacino is a guy we all know and love and respect and blah, 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 and he's the moral center of the movie, which means what he says must be good. Uh, so what happens here? So it's 1977, a Jewish couple show up at a government, uh, a barbecue, government official of some sense or other, and the lady says, oh, he's a Nazi. And the guy tries to blow it off. He's got a southern accent. And when he doesn't, he doesn't, can't blow it off. He pulls out a gun and shoots everybody. Shoots everybody. Shoots the Jewish couple. Shoots every member of his family. And then just sits there and waits for a fellow Nazi to show up because the Nazis are going to take over America. Right. So it has, really has nothing to do with reality because that wouldn't this happen is, in reality. This so this is, a, this, is this, a, this is a paranoid fantasy based on uh, uh, fear. Okay, the t the, you've got the, a group of people who have rejected Logos. That means there's no order in the universe other than what they impose. If they are not capable of imposing order, then there will be mayhem and chaos, and they are, they are justified in doing anything, anything they see fit in order to reimpose that order. Now, anything in this instance means murder. They are, if you are suspected of being a Nazi, they can murder you. That's, that's the message of this movie. And they can murder you with, with good conscience. Now, without, without a trial. No, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. How do they, you're suspected, you know, unless you're, in a, in a civilized world, 
if you were suspected of a crime, you would be arrested and then put on trial. Well, no, no, that's not, that's not what these people are talking about. No, 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 no. That's, that's, for, nor, that's for the goyim, okay? He said, this is, uh, this is uh, so, so the plot then goes to there's a woman gets murdered and then we meet the grandson. Grandson's name is Jonah. And then there's a wake and then the Al Pacino character approaches Jonah and says, if he can help you out, I'll, let, me do, let me know. So he goes as bail uh, after the kid gets arrested in a drug bust. And then Jonah and uh, Meyer Offerman have this conversation in which uh, Jonah, you know, if my grandmother was killed and Meyer says, well, I think I, think I can help you. And then uh, they get into this thing where it's Nazis, it's the Fourth Reich. We're, we're, the, the Nazis are going to take over America if we don't do something immediately. So we got, uh, oh, wow, that's serious. So then we have uh, Jonah saying, uh, you know, well, uh, you know, it's been a long time. We tried to do it, blah, blah, blah. And then Jonah says, well, did you go to the authorities uh, in a previous instance of someone who was suspected of being a Nazi? Now, that would mean, okay, we're going to arrest the guy. We put him on trial. And if he's found guilty, he's punished. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's for the goyim, okay? Uh, he says, this is what Al Pacino says. He says, well, we tried. We went through all the proper channels. We were laughed at, we meaning Jews, okay? They didn't believe us. So I took the matter to the senator. I said, I know the congressman that I got elected, but they ignored me. No one dared stake their reputation on investing some Jew killings. So with nowhere else to turn, we made a vow. We would find these criminals ourselves and bring God's justice to bear on them. Well, how do you know it's God's justice? Who, who are you? Who are you as the, the infallible spokesman for God's justice? Well, that's the story of St. Paul when the, the, the 40 uh, uh, Jews got together and made a vow not to eat anything for 40, you know, not to eat anything till, or drink anything until they eat them. And yet it was bypassing the whole legal system. Yes, and you could say they had maybe had more legitimacy because they were the body of, uh, of the, the Jews, the Jewish people, Jewish government. But anyway, that's what, that's what, uh, that's what Meyer Offerman says. And Jonah says, you mean murder then? Murder, Offerman responds. No, Jonah, this is not murder. Before Jews even existed, ancient slaughter awaited us for thousands of years. From Masada to Munich, we've been murdered. Pharaohs and popes and princes called for our blood. And now we survived the war. We survived the greatest mass eradication in modern history. And we arrived home to find that the people who did this are our neighbors. So tell me, what should we do? Shake hands? Turn a blind eye? Forget? No, no. The greatest single gift of the Jewish people is our capacity to remember. And it's because of our memory that we know this is survival. This is not murder. This is mitzvah, which is the Jewish word for blessing, Hebrew word for blessing. We have no choice. We must instill fear. Send a message. Let them know, not again, no more, no more, Jonah. Nip it in the bud. What does that mean? Nip it in the bud. That means before they do something. Preemptive strike. This is preemptive strike. This is like the, uh, the lesson of uh, Iraq and 9-11. This is, this is Jewish culture here. Am I making this up? Didn't he say this? Isn't he talking about this? This will ensure the survival of the Jewish people. In other words, to be a good Jew here, you have to take the law into your own hands. Now, we're not supposed to object to that. This is, this is the moral center of this movie. And this man is telling it that, that everything you believe about America, okay, about the right to a fair trial, the right to the first First Amendment rights of free speech. That means nothing. It's a piece of paper, crumple it up and throw it in the trash can. We are going to take the law into our own hands. And if you don't like it, tough luck. And if you happen to be one of the people 
that we suspect of something bad, then we have a right to kill you. Well, they're doing it in the name of Jewish survival, but our American policy sometimes, national security. In the name of national security, what are we willing? Well, that's because of the Jewish takeover of our foreign policy, which began with, well, where do you want to say? 9-11? Uh, do you want to talk about uh, 2003, the Iraq War? Which was, by the way, some, we nipped it in the bud, remember? Remember, that's exactly what that was. They had weapons of mass destruction, remember? And so therefore, we were justified in invading their country and killing hundreds of thousands of people because we needed to nip it in the bud. So that was the foreign policy. And now this is the only the logical domestic application of the same principle that got applied in American foreign policy in 2003. That's what's going on here, OK? And if you object to it, then you're an anti-Semite. Well, I, that reminds me of uh, when I had lunch with Kevin McDonald, and he said, uh, what the Jews fear the most is a strong father in the home. I mean, I don't know exactly how he's phrasing that, but you could fear anything. You could fear there's no end to what you may perceive to be a well, threat. I, I, could, I mean, I could perceive the guy across the three street as a threat to me. You know, I mean, maybe he said bad things about me. You know, maybe he, you know, who knows what he did? Do, do I have a right to go shoot him uh, because I perceive that he's a threat? No one has that right except this group of people. And they have that right because they control the media and they put on sh shows like Hunters, which is basically their uh, proof that they have this right and their attempt to take back the narrative, control of the narrative that they lost in 2019. Okay, now. The prob there's a problem here, and we've addressed it here as well before. The problem was with the, the Poway shootings. Remember in uh, Poway and also in Pittsburgh, more so in both instances, I believe, the man who did the shooting wrote a manifesto. At least one did. One did. The guy, I think at Poway did, but, uh, and the basically was that uh, he was afraid that they were, uh, uh, the situation in uh, Pittsburgh was that he was afraid that immigrants were taking over his country, and he was upset with the Pittsburgh synagogue because they declared they have a pro-immigrant group there, and they, de they declared that they had the right to break the law right. because they were operating according to a higher good. Well, what I'm saying is be careful when you say that. And I said it then. I said if you say that you have the right to break the law, then you're giving that right to someone else. And that someone else may break it in a way that you don't like. Well, you said that here all the time with Mayor Pete Buttigieg, that if he has the right to right. break the moral law. I said this on uh, one of our mainstream TV stations. They asked me, was I afraid? You come walking around my neighborhood. Am I afraid that there's going to be an attack on Pete Buttigieg? Well, no, to be honest with you, no. But what I said was, if you have a man who brags about his ability to break the moral law when it comes to sodomy, which is what he did. His whole campaign was based on this. Uh, then you're giving a license to other people to break the law in areas that you may not like. So maybe it's a fellow sodomite who uh, engages in that type of perverted activity. And yeah, I agree with what, well, what about if somebody comes up and shoots you because he doesn't like the fact that you're a sodomite. Well, no, that's different. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. The, the, the Jews are saying that they are above the moral law and that they don't have to follow the moral law. And then they're suddenly presuming that there will be no consequences for them if they say this. But, but they could easily say, well, that's not what we're saying. But many people are getting the impression right. that watch this that this right. is what you're saying. So what, no matter what you say, as Shakespeare said, you're teaching bloody instructions. And so, uh, what, le what instructions are you teaching when it just this past spring, uh, you have Palestinians marching toward the apartheid wall in Israel, and you have snipers shooting them. You have sh snipers shooting women and children. Women and children, a woman, a journalist walking away, running away from the wall, being shot in the back. And there's no, no moral, no, no consequence for these actions. This is a flagrant violation of the moral law. And the Jews are saying, we have this right uh, because we're Jews. That's pretty much what they're saying. Well, 
this is this these movies are a function, in my opinion, of the guilty conscience which arises when you do that kind of thing. And 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 the best example in recently, and it was the inspir one of the inspirations for this movie was the film Munich. Steven Spielberg. Now the guy who did this, whose name I forget at the moment, uh, is is a crude kind of uh, approximation of what Spielberg did in Munich. Now Munich is the story of the Munich uh, Olympic massacres, where Jews were taken, Israelis were taken hostage, and then the uh, uh, they tried to rescue them, and it, it went wrong, and the, they all got killed. So at that point, the Mossad decides, well, they're going to go out and take the law into their own hands and kill the people that they uh, suspected of doing this. Okay, so that means the Mossad hands you, as the Nazi hunter, a list. Here's a dossier. Here's a picture. Go out and kill them. So they go, and one of the scenes is first killing. They confront this elderly uh, Palestinian man on the streets of Rome, and they're saying, are you so-and-so? Whatever the guy's name was, I forget. Are you so and so? And he's he's like they got guns on him. <laughs> you know, well, uh, are you? Do you know who we are? Why are we here? And and so I, I, and they shoot him. Well, wait a minute. He didn't even get to answer your question, and you shot him. Maybe it was the wrong guy. Isn't this why we have trials to make sure you're going to shoot the right guy? Well, no, no. That they don't have to follow those rules. That's that's for lesser human beings. That's for the goyim. These people have a superior morality which allows them to kill anybody they don't like. So again in Munich, so this is going on, it gets more and more laborious here. And so they bust into this house where all these Palestinians are living, and it's mayhem. Everybody's screaming, women and children are running around screaming. The light's not good, and so he goes over, he's got a picture. And they hold the picture up next to the guy. Is that the guy? Yeah, it looks like him. It's like dark, half dark. There's no lighting's not good. They hold the picture. Yeah, it's him. Shoot him, and they kill him. Well, wait a minute. This is barbarous behavior. No civilized people will do this kind of thing. And these people have a right to be uncivilized whenever they feel threatened. And now they feel threatened. Okay. So now we're getting. So let's get back to the plot here. Now this is 1977. And they're claiming that there are Nazis around in 1977. Well, I was around in 1977. And to be honest with you, the one thing going through my mind, it wasn't fear that Nazis were going to take over the American government the Amer and, and create the Fourth Reich. I don't know, maybe you were worried about that in 77, but I wasn't. Well, you I don't think I anybody met, was. I, had, I, I, I did get a, a ride hitchhiking by a guy who was a, a Nazi. That was in 71. 70, well, this is 77. Yeah. Had, yeah. Okay, so everybody's getting kind of old, and, and there are people who felt that the fact that the woman, like she looks like a 30-year-old woman, and she's saying, I remember, well, no, if you're 30 years old in 77, means you were born in 37. The camps really didn't open them until 43. So maybe it's your memory. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you don't remember correctly. People change, you know what I mean? Uh, so, so, but now this is, 2020. Okay, so the youngest, uh, so if you were born in, in, uh, in 1920, that means you were 19 years old when the war started. Okay, so that's pretty late. If you were born in 1930, uh, you were nine years old when the war started. If you're born in 1940, you were one, you were, uh, that was one year after the war had started. Okay? So, I hate to break this to you, but there are no more Nazis out there. They just found one, a guy who's 92 years old. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I just don't. But again, at least they didn't shoot him. They deported him, okay, which is improvement over just going out and shooting him. So, what does that mean? So, he's not really, so they can't be really talking about Nazis in this movie. No, they're not talking about Nazis. Who worries about Nazis? But that's what they're saying, but it can't be. Do you worry about Hussites? <laughs> I don't worry about Hussites. Uh, they were a threat to all of Europe for a time, but I don't worry about them. I don't, no, none of them are around now. But who is around? What, so now, what, what's the issue here? This is 2020. What is the issue? The issue is the, the issue we began with of the Jews losing control of the narratives. So who is the threat now? Well, it's anti-Semites. It's anti-Semites. So the question here is, 
you're talking about, this movie is talking about what they perceive to be anti-Semites. So if you take the movie at face value, the question is, do Jews today have a right to shoot someone that they consider an anti-Semite? What, what else, what other conclusion are you going to draw here? This is it. This is the only, this is the existential issue as of 2020. When this movie, movie was made, I don't know, over, probably over the course of 2018, 2019, that is the existential issue at this point. So that means, do you have a right to shoot someone you think is an anti-Semite? Well, Jesus said if you hate somebody, you're already a murderer. So in other words, do they have a right to hate somebody? Yes, they do, because hate is a Jewish virtue. That's not me. If I say it, that sounds like anti-Semitism. But Rabbi Meyer Solvachik said that in First Things, which is supposed to be a neoconservative magazine. He said hate was a Jewish virtue and wrote a whole article pointing that out. Well, this, this brings in, you know, Jesus said if you have lust in your heart, you commit adultery. And if you have hate in your heart, in your heart you commit murder. Those are the two he really focused on. And they've been fogging up the idea that, well, you can have lust in your heart like for another guy, guy, and, and, and that's not a problem. Well, in other words, well, I have a right to hate anti-Semites, you know, as long as I don't do anything. Well, well, now, wait a minute. This, this movie is giving you the right to do something. Well, there's the point. There's the whole point here. So, wait a minute. Let's get back to the original problem here. Are people inciting hatred on the Internet? Remember hate speech? I know it. Hate speech. People are inciting hatred on the internet. Who is inciting hatred here? The Jews are inciting hatred. They are, if this movie is not incitement to violence and hatred, there is no meaning to those words. Well, going back to what happened with, with the black revolutionary being the type, and then they, I mean, like, all of a sudden, the black revolutionary was not what the young black men wanted to be. And it happened to be because those two movies. Does anybody say it wasn't? Yeah, so, so this is hate speech. There is no way to get around the fact that this movie is hate speech. No way. No way around it. And not only is it hate speech, it's a direct incitement of violence against people like me. Now, why do I say that? Because I have been publicly identified as an anti-Semite. That means that they, these people, the people who made this movie, are threatening my life. That is not an exaggeration. That is exactly what this movie does. This is hate speech, it's incitement to violence, and no one is saying anything about it. No one is complaining. This is complete Funkstiller. But if you, if you preach the gospel like St. Peter did, and you... Uh, Identify, say that, the, well, I don't know how you would say it, but if you say that, well, the Jews need to repent and believe on Jesus Christ, and they felt offended that they needed to repent and believe on Jesus Christ, isn't it possible they could, the way you say, well, I believe he's anti Semite, look at the way he says it, or something well, like okay, that? Well, okay, so what's the difference here? There's a difference here. There is an objective category called Nazi, it was a political party in Germany. You had to join the political party, and you had an objective uh, group of people, an objective category called the Nazi. And so in, in any court of law, you could go and say, well, here is where he signed the paper joining up. Here was his membership card. Here's the picture, blah, blah, blah. It's objective. Now, how does that, that change now? Now the criterion is anti-Semite. Well, there is no objective reality here. Well, McCarthy couldn't blame somebody for being a communist unless, he, unless they were. I mean, wasn't that the issue? The issue was that there were communists, and actual communists, we found that out later on. The, the term anti-Semite is purely a category of the mind. It has no meaning outside of the ADL, which created the term basically to silence anybody that they didn't like. So now you have a right to kill someone if you don't like them. Or there's, no, there's no objective criterion here. The, only, the closest thing to an objective criterion, and the only reason I would consider it a threat to me, is I've been identified according to this category of the ADL's mind, which has no correspondence to reality. But in their None. mind, in their mind they feel 
that you don't like Jews. Isn't that what they... Is, that is not that, true. I love Jews. But isn't that what makes... Oh, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. I love Jews. Right, but isn't that... I have said that many times, okay? Why, why, do I, why do I say I love them? Because the Jews are my enemy. And Christians are supposed to love their enemy. Now, the Christians don't go out and kill people who are their enemy. No, they're supposed to love their enemy. Okay? That's my belief. Okay? Yeah, but could be I have they, never, ever urged any type of violence on Jews. But that, but that's never. A, but that's I, I've, I've, I've prefaced one program after another. We did, actually did a compilation of this where I said, that, you know, the secret Judeus non, the traditional teaching on the Jews, stipulates no one has the right to harm the Jew. I've said that over and over and over again. But, but, you're, and, take, but you're taking that phrase out of the New Jerusalem Bible. I'm just guessing. New Jerusalem Bible says the Jews are enemies of all mankind, where the King James, it might be even be the Dewey Reims, uh, says they're contrary to all men. Is there a difference? No, okay. because they're both translations. Right. They're both translations. So the I one... Mean, do we, we, no, no. I mean, this, this sounds like Dr. Brown. This is the type of stuff Dr. Brown brings up. <laughs> it's not Jews, it's Judeans because he found one translation of 1 Thessalonians 2 that didn't use the word Jew. Right. And so you bring up, well, they're both referring to hoi judeoi in the Greek, and that means the Jews. So no, it's not, it's, the, the gist of it is, is that they are enemies. They're enemies of the gospel, and they're enemies of the entire human race. That's what, that's, that, that is the, the translation in the New Jerusalem Bible, which I happen to read, okay? So no, it's a question of, do we have enemies? Well, yes. Then the question is, how do we deal with our enemies? Well, we got two completely different views here. The Christian says you should love your enemies. The Jew says you have a right to murder anyone you perceive as your enemy, even if they've done nothing uh, overtly against you. So we're not talking, this is what nip it in the bud means here. It's not as if there's a man who is approaching you, uh, broke into your home or is approaching you with a gun and it's self-defense. No, this is nip it in the bud. This is preemptive, uh, preemptive strike against someone that you perceive either rightly or wrongly to be a threat. And you're acting out of some type of moral panic. And that is the mind, the Jewish mind at the moment. And that's the mindset that led to the creation of this movie. Well, I mean, Bernie Sanders is going down, but the, the, I mean, there was like these fears that they caught on camera. Some of his uh, people working for him, you know, we're, we're going to set up gulags, you know. Well, then people started thinking about the Soviet Union, and if, if if they thought you were thinking about God almost, if they thought you were believing in God in some real serious fashion, well, the, the Soviet Union would might just send you to Siberia, right? Out of just this fear. I'm not. I'm not getting the drift here. What are you saying? That if I if I suspect someone and I have some type of irrational fear that someone might do something, I have a right to kill them. You're 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 found. Who would say that? Who in their who in their wildest fantasies would say something like that? Uh, this group of people did say that. Yeah. So yeah. it's not hypothetical. This is what they did. I don't see anyone holding this group of people responsible for hate speech. We have the endorsement of one of the biggest uh, uh, series producers on the, on, on, the, uh, on the new media, endorsing this point of view, and no one's, no one's objecting. And, and, and I can tell you right now, the fact that we are objecting is going to be used as evidence that we're anti-Semites. Because I'm objecting to the fact that there is an overt threat of violence here, and it's unconscionable, and it violates everything that America stands for as a country. Because if we don't have due process under the law here, we don't have anything. Well, That's all America has. Harvey Weinstein just got 20, we just read in the paper, he just got 23 years. Okay. Right. He produced movie after movie. This is the guy that now they're saying such a terrible person was producing all kinds of bad movies. Um, well, yeah. Doesn't yeah. Hollywood produce bad movies? With with evil intent of some kind? Is this a surprise? Well, the, what the point here is that it's gotten more and more overt. So we've talked before about the whole 
legion of decency and how the Catholics kept Hollywood under control for a number of years, from 33 to 65. The Jews broke that code with a Holocaust porn flick uh, called Pawn The Pawnbroker. Okay, over this period of time since 65, they have become more and more outrageous in their flagrant transgression of all social norms. Okay, so it began with pornography. The bare breast in the pawnbroker, that led to uh, deep throat seven years later. Pornography, by any definition of the term, being shown in first-run theaters. And when Deep Throat came out, that was huge. Yeah, of course it was. And it was portrayed. Now, you have, here's an example of what we're talking about. Uh, you can type in uh, to your YouTube search engine, William F. Buckley and Alan Dershowitz. And you have Alan Dershowitz there defending Deep Throat on freedom of speech, First Amendment grounds. No one, no. No lawyer would ever do this, but Dershowitz did. Obscenity had always been excluded, and so you had this period around that time uh, where if it had redeeming social value, it was you were allowed to show nudity and then sexual activity and so on and so forth. Now, as a, as a clear indication of from then, that was then and this is now, the same Alan Dershowitz that defended Deep Throat is standing beside Donald Trump when he signs the bill criminalizing criticism of Israel into law. Now, is this hypocrisy or what? What's going on here? Maybe it's not, not as far as this is. Concerned. This is what he's, he, uh, so at this point, you're willing to defend pornography as long as it will tear down the moral fiber of the country. Why do you want to tear down the moral fiber of the country? Because then you get to take over. So you get to say what the commands are. It used to be the Ten Commandments, which you got from your church, and now it's going to be uh, Hollywood's version of the Ten Commandments, eventuating ultimately in political correctness, which is the new Ten Commandments. Okay, uh, and Ultimately, it comes down to uh, from free speech to hate speech legislation. This is the trajectory of Jewish control over our media. This is what, what happened here. It went from one extreme to the other, and one man actually espoused both positions. So Dershowitz is now saying, basically, uh, we're, we're ready to send to jail anybody who criticizes Israel's immoral behavior. And that's consonant with saying, uh, deep throat is protected by free speech. What's, what's the one concept? What's the, what's the explanation of this? Well, it's a form of control. This is, I wrote a book on this. It's called Libido Dominandi, Sexual Liberation and Political Control. Sexual liberation is always used as a form of control. And so what you do is you use this, this pornography, to break down the moral fiber of the country which means saying there's no rules anymore, you can do whatever you want. Well, you can never do whatever you want. So someone's got to oppose the law, and so now you have political correctness taking the place of the Ten Commandments. And you have a Jew like Alan Dershowitz enforcing political correctness, using his stooge, President Donald Trump, to, to basically override the First Amendment in a place where it clearly should apply and putting in these speech codes laws uh, in its place. But he doesn't have as much credibility as he used to because if you look at the comments when Dershowitz is there. Yeah, and what's the main thing that destroyed Alan Dershowitz's credibility? Epstein, Jeffrey Epstein. He was on the Lolita Express. Oh, okay. Okay, but that's, that's anti-Semitic to bring that up, you know, because what's that got to do? Just the fact that, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, it's a colossal double standard. If there's any, uh, the epitome of the colossal double standard in our culture is Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz, and the point is that over this period of time, we have awoken to that fact. And that's what you're saying, that, uh, that uh, over the course of 2019, the Jews lost control of the narrative? Is right. that part yeah. of it? Okay. Yeah, we've awoken to this. Everybody knows it now. Uh, we are starting to talk about it. We're starting to draw consequences, conclusions from this. And uh, they don't like it, and they're trying to get control back, and that's why they're producing movies like this. It's not the only one. Uh, within a week now, we're going to have uh, the plot against America, 
by uh, the, the novel Roth. was written by Philip Roth, who's now dead. But this is another paranoid Jewish fantasy about the 1930s this time, and uh, uh, claiming that uh, Charles Lindbergh is running for president and he's going to round up all the Jews and put them in concentration camps. Uh, this is an outrageous defamation of a man that every American considered a hero. And the only reason that uh, he ran afoul of this because he wanted to keep America out of World War II. He was the, one of the pillars of the America First movement in the 1930s. He gave a speech in, in Iowa, gave it in many places, but in which he said there are three groups that are trying to get us into the war, the Roosevelt administration, the English, and the Jews. And as soon as he said that word, the Jews declared him their enemy and did everything within their power to destroy him, even to the point of Philip Roth, 50 years later, 50, 60 years later, writing a novel, which is another paranoid Jewish fantasy that has no basis in reality, no basis whatsoever. Yeah. And now we're getting it as a movie, and we're supposed to take this seriously. Why are we supposed to take this seriously? Well, because you control who, gave, who makes the movies, and the movies control what we think. This had serious consequences for, I mean, like my dad's older brother just got out of Notre Dame. He's at ROTC, and a month before Pearl Harbor, you know, they had shortened the training time, only had a few hours left, he crashes. Everybody was affected by, Lindbergh is trying to say, let's, let's think rationally here, uh, we're making a wrong move, and nobody, nobody could listen. Now, the irony, again, an irony here is that Donald Trump evoked America first, and that got him elected president, because that is, that's the zeitgeist right now. That is the spirit of the times. We are looking for America first, and anybody who evokes it is going to win, because we are so sick now of these foreign wars that have led to nothing. What, we just pulled out of Afghanistan in a way that makes the, you know, that last, remember the last helicopter out of Saigon? Yeah. Where the guy's hanging on the runners, you know, and this is, we declared victory, and there's the taking off from the American embassy, guys hang. The, the pull out of Afghanistan, it makes, makes that look like a victory parade by comparison. We wasted 19 years in that country. Thousands of Americans died, trillion dollars at least, most of which was stolen one way or the other. To do what? The only plausible explanation is that it was there to allow the CIA to take over the heroin trade. It's the only plausible explanation. Nothing, uh, nothing showed up. <laughs> no other explanation. Uh, nothing else is plausible. And everybody's sick of it. Or like uh, Senator Nye, who helped start the American First Movement. Remember, he was the head of the armaments. Uh, he was the head of the committee to discover what was the cause of World War One, and yeah. he said it was the armaments. Yeah. So it's basically the military-industrial complex benefited by that war. Uh, yeah. Be Benjamin Friedman gave a speech uh, in 1960 uh, where he claimed he was in the room uh, when that happened. He said basically that England had lost the war, lost World War One. There was no hope. England was ready to sign an armistice, uh, which would accept the status quo ante, you know, situation before the war. And at this point, the Jews came in into the picture. Uh, they went to the British and said, uh, "We will uh, get America into the war." Uh, Wilson was running. They, they 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 had the campaign. They put money into his campaign. We will get America into the war, even though Wilson said he was going to keep America out of the war. But the, the, the quid pro quo here is that you have to allow us our own homeland in Palestine. That was the deal, according to Benjamin Friedman, and that's what happened. So immediately after that, America enters the war, and then the, the British issue the Balfour Statement, which says the Jews deserve a homeland, and the rest is the history up you know, to this point. Right, it would have been totally different. And then you had you know, the Germans... They, you know, all kinds of things were happening. You know, the, the stab in the back myth, and, it, and basically the Nazi if, party was created. Right. If there weren't, if so if they had a punitive peace, the Versailles Treaty was punitive. That outraged the German people, and then there was a man who came along and capitalized on that outrage, and that was Adolf Hitler.
So if there had been a, a status quo anti-peace, uh, which was going to happen, there would have been no World War II. If there was no World War II, there would have been no State of Israel, and we wouldn't have been felt obliged to invade Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, Libya, all of these places where we displaced millions of people. And those millions of people are now heading once again to the border with Europe, threatening to overwhelm the country. All of that comes back to these fateful decisions. World War I, World War II, uh, the Iraq War, all of these things, uh, and the people who tried to prevent this, who tried to keep America out of those wars, like Charles Lindbergh, the great hero, a great American hero, who is now going to be demonized as a Nazi. But the problem is you got guys like David Irving who, who comes up with a different type of history, but the history that you're going to get by the people that win the wars, and even the ones that lose end up is a different history than that. You're, they're not going to be told. Well, the question is, who, who gets to write the history? So what you have here are two examples of revisionist history being written by people who see the American people as the enemy. The American people are the enemy here. I mean, you can say, oh, it's not all the American. Well, it's the American system is certainly perceived as antithetical to Jewish interests. The American system of rule by law the fact that you have a right to a trial, the right to face your accusers, all of this is being thrown in the trash can by Meyer Offerman, who has this superior Jewish morality that allows him to nip it in the bud. This is not murder. This is mitzvah. Yeah, but that's just how is it possible? How is it possible to deal with this type of arrogance? We're not even allowed to object to this type of arrogance. This is barbaric. Arrogance. But that's just art. Don't they have the freedom to do art? Movie is art. That's their freedom. And there's no proof this is going to affect anybody. Isn't that their argument? There's no proof this, this influences people. Well, then why do they demonize people like me? I, I, give, I do a show like this, and they're saying I'm responsible for the shootings in Pittsburgh and Poway. Because of what I said, even though what I said was no one has the right to harm the Jew. Now, if that, if I'm responsible, even though I said that, then aren't these people responsible? When they say you have a right to murder, you have a right to hate certain people, and if, if, you, if they hate you, they have a right to murder you. Who, this is not civilized behavior. No, the evidence shows that these movies do have, can have a real drastic effect. We don't these know. These people determine, these movies determine what is accepted discourse and what is not. What is acceptable discourse? What is not acceptable discourse? The movies determine that. We have no other way of determining it in our culture. Because when it comes to expression, you have the right to say pretty much anything except calling for fire in a crowded theater and libel. Okay, And even that is, is subject to uh, all sorts of external constraints. So they are, they, these people, through the control of the, the media, get to determine what is acceptable and what is not. And they're saying it is acceptable it's acceptable if a Jew says he has a right to murder you. Well, that's why he you said like here you. the Catholic Church lost when the pawnbroker came out. And they lost when the, um, the de Legion of Decency with uh, Joseph Breen uh, folded. And you said that, right? So when we lose these battles, it's huge. I'm saying the consequence back then it looked like, oh, it's just a question of nudity in films, and it's only a question of bare breasts, and it's artistically, you know, it's got artistic value. It's a concentration camp. This, these people suffered there, so dead, let's just do the nudity here. And then you have the establishment of the tradition of Holocaust porn. Okay, the next big step in that direction is Schindler's List, which is uh, Spielberg's contribution to Holocaust porn. And the person who objected to that was none other than uh, Mr. Howard, Sh Howard. Howard Stern, okay, who's outraged at the fact that they're going to show Schindler's List on television. And how come he was put to uh, the, the well, wait a minute, He's the, on Sirius. I yeah. mean, you have to go in your car and turn. God knows how you get to Sirius. But now these, and he's banned to that, to the out to the Siberia of uh, of media, you know. 
uh, because people don't like what he says, but Schindler, because he's got this license to do Holocaust porn, he can do it on, on Al Howard Sh Stern is outraged. So you got one outrageous example of another, and eh, they're not going to stop. So now they can advocate murder, <coughs> murder of fellow Americans, and we're supposed to cheer them on. This is outrageous. This is outrageous. Why is no one objecting to this? But you're saying at the same time, though, the movement <coughs> for American First is, is picking up steam. So they're trying to recapture the narrative, but you're, you're kind of saying that you don't think they will, right? Or what? Why? This movie has the opposite effect. And to get the, other, the other example that we didn't talk about was uh, Inglorious Bastards, which was uh, Tarantino's film. And that's a Nazi film. And uh, the guy who really nailed this was Gilad Osman, the Israeli who was in the IDF, who did a review of it. And he said, basically, this is an anti-Jewish movie <laughs> because the Nazis are all portrayed as gentlemen. You know, you got Christopher Waltz, and they, you know, they're, they're cultured, they're, they speak foreign languages. And then you've got these Nazi hunters that are basically barbarians. And you end up, you end up hating, hating the Nazi hunters by the end of the movie. They're not supposed to do that. <coughs> Why are they doing what's going on? Well, it's called the cunning of reason. Because just be so, the big question is, was that uh, Tarantino's intention? That's, that's kind of subtle. Uh, if you say that was Tarantino's intention. I think that Gilad Osman is actually going to the, going there and saying it probably was Tarantino's intention. To get it, to, to, it's like a confession or what, what is it? No, he's not going to admit it because that would get him banned from Hollywood. But I mean, I, it, it, the intention seems to be to make Jews look like ruthless killers and uh, to gain sympathy for the Nazis. That's what that movie does. Well, Hunters does it too. And uh, lo and behold, it turns out that the two uh, inspirations for this movie are Munich and Inglorious Bastards. And what you see here, the difference is that with Munich, you've got a lot of agonizing in Munich. So the characters at a certain point thinking, well, maybe we didn't shoot the right guy. And they're starting to get this. So it comes down to, as I said, the difference between a good Jew and a bad Jew is that the, uh, the, the good Jew, when he shoots you, he yes. feels bad about it. Yeah. The bad Jew doesn't feel bad about it. And that's pretty much the conclusion of Spielberg's movie. Well, then by the time you get to Inglorious Bastards, it's comic book. It's like superhero. And that's another influence on this thing that the, the director said the same thing. His name is David Weil. But he said that that was another influence on, uh, on Hunters. Comic books. It's clear when you watch the thing. So, well, is, there, is there an unconscious so, wish? Well, I think, I think what you're seeing is the degradation of taste that goes on here. It begins with Munich, and you're kind of agonizing. Maybe we did the wrong thing. And then you get to Inglorious Bastards. And basically, you're just cheering. It's just lust, this kind of hatred. And you, you, you're lusting after the people being tortured and killed. You know, they're carving swastikas in your forehead and stuff like that. You know? And now this is further. So it's not quite, it, it, it's, it's as violent, I think it's as violent as Inglorious Bastards, but there's a lot more rational, rationalizing that's going on in this thing. You know, Offerman, Al Pacino, he's like the moral center of everything. He's like the most revered guy in Hollywood, and he's saying, it's not, this is not murder, this is mitzvah, speaking for the entire Jewish race here. Where are the Jews? Where are the Jews, where are the civilized Jews, by the way? Am I, where are they? Why aren't they objecting to this movie? I know there are rabbis out there who must think this is totally repugnant. Where are they? Is it just that you'll never get allowed to be, uh, uh, you get a forum to say this? Yeah, but you're saying this is making them look bad, actually? Who? Uh, the, the, the Jews. I mean, of course it makes them look bad. But why do they want to make themselves look bad? Because they don't know what they're doing. They don't want to make themselves look bad. Is there an unconscious wish? I mean, come on. They know what's happening. They know they're making themselves look bad. No, I don't think that's true. Really? I don't think that's true. But you're, think, you're saying... They are making themselves look bad. You come away with this thinking, thinking, God, God help us. God help us. Th where is Rabbi David Weiss? The guy, I met him, and he's, a ra he, he's a part of Netherite Karta. He thinks that uh, Zionism is an abomination, uh, said so many times publicly. Has he said something about Munich? Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry, about uh, Hunters? Probably not. They don't watch TV. 
you know, they're, they're, so he's probably not saying anything like that. But where is the response here? There should be a response. There's no response. It's just Funkstille. It comes down to basically me and you. We're the only people talking about it. Sorry. That's an indication of how far gone we are. Well, their, their only excuse would be to say, well, they don't believe it. It really has any impact. It doesn't affect people's behavior. But on the other side, well, then don't, don't you have a right to do a critique of those synagogue shootings in Pittsburgh like you have in the po way without being charged with, well, you just, by just saying that you caused that killing, it's like, but that movie's causing nothing? It looks like a double standard. Absolutely. And, and, and what is a double standard? How do you break that word, double standard, down? One rule for them and another rule for us. Yeah, but everything, I thought we're all equal. We're a nation this under an law attack. and everybody's equal. This is an attack on everything we believe as Americans. And the most fundamental thing we believe in as Americans is the rule of law. This is a, 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 an attack, a vicious attack on the rule of law. Now, you can't do this and not expect some type of pushback. If it's okay for you to basically hold the law in contempt, don't be surprised when someone acts on that in a way that you don't like. Right, because James says if you break the law at even one point, you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. That's right. So if you don't want to, if you don't choose not to correct where you're obviously breaking the law, <laughs> you got the way. Be careful. You got the weight of all the law coming down on Be you. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. You may get it. Okay. Well, that's, um, that's a good review. Uh, we didn't go into the other aspect of it, but that's fine. Um, another show. Another show. Okay. So um, we have one minute left. This is the show Israel, which, uh, to repeat, is I named the show Israel to emphasize that Jesus is referred to as Israel in Matthew chapter 2, referring back to Hosea 11, and that those who are in Christ are also then considered in Israel, or the church is referred to as Israel. Now, you would say as a Catholic, Catholic Church we is We are new the with, new Israel. Right, right. But that's based on Jesus is the true Israel. And if you believe on him, you become part of that. So, till next time, Dr. E. Michael Jones and Peter Hellens.